everyone and welcome to episode 17 of the movies of 1999 a podcast where we watch a movie from 1999 each week as selected by bingo machine my name is jason hutchins and i'm craig talbot and this week we are going to be talking about pleasantville which is the movie that we watched at last week's movie night and that was paired up with girl interrupted and i must say on the movie night bruce commented that he was surprised that Girl Interrupted wasn't on my A list, so maybe we can delve into that. Now, I mentioned last podcast that I'm traveling, so that means Craig and I are recording this podcast early. So thanks very much for making room in your schedule, Craig, to record this midweek. Yes, this has certainly been a bit of a, a bit of hard work last night, but yes, uh, I'm not. I don't know if I'm quite up to my regular standard, but hopefully it all goes well and. Uh, We've got an interesting intermission this week as well. So oh, looking forward to the intermission. A new, a new topic. So I think we'll kick things off by talking about why you th- well, why I chose Pleasantville. And, and I'd always known about this movie and I watched it back in the day and I remember it being quite good. So when I saw it was 99, although, of course, it's one of those ones that's on the border, isn't it, where the Australian release was 99. The US release was 98. But when I saw that it was on the list of Australian releases, then I put it straight onto the A list because I had fond memories of it. But why, Craig, do you think that was paired up with Girl Interrupted? Uh, I've actually got no idea with this one. Unless they, I'm not sure, is Pleasantville based on a book or something? Because I... I don't think Pleasantville is based on a book. But I think for me, if I was going to say something, it was it was probably the journey that the people <clears throat> go on. Like it's it's almost like a fish out of water story. Someone's put into a situation where they they sort of discover who they are, I suppose, like that. But it, it's a fairly tenuous link. I mean, I did notice that both of them were nominated for Oscars, so that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I. I, I couldn't really find a link between these two. They're quite different movies, quite different topics. So. And I think Girl Interrupted is set in the 60s. Pleasantville is set in the 90s, but then they travel to the 50s. So, mm. yeah. There's about a 10-year gap between them in terms of the time that they yeah. mostly spend in both of the movies. I have been asking ChatGPT to come up with a link as well. So we'll see what it says when it reads out Mm. the Girl Interrupted synopsis. So talking of ChatGPT, we should probably dive in and ask it to read its synopsis for Pleasantville. So why don't we do that now? In Pleasantville, directed by Gary Ross, two 1990s teenagers, David and Jennifer, portrayed by Tobey Maguire and Reese Witherspoon, are magically transported into the black-and-white world of David's favorite 1950s sitcom, Pleasantville. As they interact with the idyllic, yet rigidly conformist world of the show, their modern attitudes and values begin to influence and transform the town, bringing color and deeper emotional and social complexities to its residents. The film cleverly uses this premise to explore themes of change, prejudice, and personal freedom, while featuring standout performances by Joan Allen, Jeff Daniels, and William H. Macy. And thank you, ChatGPT. So, Craig, what did you think of Pleasantville? Um, I actually really enjoyed this movie. This was a good one. I liked it. Yeah, it was Uh, great. I I think the audience will be happy to know that I finally liked an A-list movie, because apparently that's been a thing. Hang on, hang (laughs) on. Didn't you like the A-list movie last week? American I, well, X, or, 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 well, we both agreed that we didn't like it, but we yeah. thought it was an important and interesting movie to watch, I think. Mm. Uh, though a couple of the people at the movie night were quite surprised to hear that I didn't enjoy the movie, but I think it's not a movie that you watch to enjoy. But that's I, my personal opinion. I think it says something about the meaning of the word enjoy because, you know, I didn't have fun watching it, but it captivated me and I, mm. yeah, you know, so... I must admit, when I watched Pleasantville, I was happy, and then I watched Girl Interrupted, and I was like, 
I'm really starting to uh, wonder if Jason is messing with my sanity here in this project. Yeah, this because is all... I literally, I literally said to myself, "This is gonna, this is gonna destroy my mental health if this keeps up." <laughs> this is all just a part of mine to drive you insane. Yes. Yeah, I'm starting to feel that way. Maybe I was on the edge of insanity anyway. I tell you what, it was mm. great to see Don Knotts pop up. I'd completely oh, forgotten yeah. about Don Knotts. Yeah. But that brought back yeah. a lot of memories of rainy yeah. Sunday afternoons, turning on Channel 9 or something. They'd have this mm. old black and white movie. Uh, yeah. So Don Knotts had a few classic ones. I think there was one where he got turned into a, a cartoon fish. Right. You know, and, yeah, he sort of played this bumbling character a lot yeah. of the time, didn't he? He wasn't really a bumbling character in this one. He was a pretty forceful character. He was. Like, he was. Pretty sneaky and cunning character, actually. Mm. Yeah. And... um. I thought uh, I, I was really interested to see because obviously we watched Cider House Rules earlier in the year with Toby and and Toby Maguire was in that and he looked so much. I, I know look movie magic and all that kind of thing, but he looked so much younger in this movie he did, than he, he did yeah. in Cider House Rules. Even Reese Witherspoon looked very young in this movie compared to when I've seen her. She was almost like <clears throat> I wouldn't say she was unrecognizable, but she was playing out of type. You know, playing that kind of character. Yeah. So, so I sort yeah. of had to look twice to realise it was her. Yeah. I, and her with short hair as well. I think she had that bob mm, cut. Mm. I think she did very well. I think all of the actors in this movie were very good, actually. I can't. I mean, other than other than the ones who were a bit wooden, because I think they were meant to be a bit wooden. All like of, the, all of the background the jocks, were... yeah, the jocks and all that kind of stuff. They mm. were all meant to be a bit wooden on in a, and a bit uh, a bit silly, but the. The main characters in this movie were, were excellent, I thought. Yeah, I really like the um, mum and the dad as well. Yes, William yes H. they were both Macy, very good. Um, and Joan Allen. Joan Allen, yeah, they were great. Yeah, and Jeff Daniels, the... Uh, oh, of course, Jeff the, Daniels, the, yeah. the, the The torn and uh, Artiste. artistic yeah. artiste Jeff Daniels, which I don't think I've ever thought of <laughs> Jeff Daniels as an artiste, but there you go. He was really good, um, wasn't he? Yeah. he? He is now. So, yeah, I thought he was very good. Um don't really have anything bad to say about this mm, movie this mm. week. I've got to be honest. I, I really thought this was a. I mean, it's an eighty-six percent Rotten Tomatoes movie, yes, and a seventy-nine percent uh, audience score. And I think, interestingly, I was just going to say, I think the Rotten Tomatoes explains why this was on my A list and Girl Interrupted mm. was on my B list because I think that yes, and I it, I think we'll have to talk about that later yeah, because yeah. the Girl Interrupted score I think is <clears throat> very strange, very strange. Um, but we'll get we'll get into that later. The budget for this movie, interestingly, this movie is considered to be a flop um, because mm. it cost $60 million to make. Wow. Yeah, that's all. And lot. it only got a box office worldwide of $49 million. And that money went towards the visual effects, I guess? Cause, well, there's yeah. an interesting little factoid, if I may. Um, so since every single scene in the middle of this movie had to be digitally changed in some way because of the interaction of black and white and mm. colour and all that kind of stuff, this film for a short time, was the film that had the most digital effect shots in it until a certain sci-fi movie that I'm hanging out to see again, right. uh, which I'm not allowed, which I'm not allowed to mention the name of, <laughs> because it <laughs> comes up in our, because it come, it'll come up in our sequence. Yeah. So basically, it was the record holder for the most visual effects for a, That's right. a couple of months <laughs> until mm. this other movie mm. came along. Yeah, so it, I mean, it made heavy use of that digital effects oh, that probably done, weren't. It was done very well and. The usage of colour is so clever, like tying it into what's happening in the story. I, mm. I couldn't help thinking of Whizball, that old game. <laughs> yes, it was a bit like that, wasn't it? Where you start you out with a monochrome colors. landscape and you had, had to paint the landscape, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I was listening to our friends from uh, ZTTP yes. this, this week, actually, and they were talking about a game called Maze Mania, which sounded like it had a similar idea. Oh. You had to roll a little ball around a right maze, and it it changed color. Color things in. So yeah, yeah, that kind of that kind of idea. I mean, there's lots of games that are based on that idea. This movie, by the way, was nominated for three Oscars. I um, didn't win any of them, unfortunately. I think it probably probably should have, to be mm, honest. Mm. Now, this is the first movie that we've watched, which is considered a fantasy movie. I'm not quite sure what a yeah. fantasy movie is. But that's what this one is considered. Well, it, and it's yeah, it's like a fairy tale or a fable or something like that, mm, isn't it? So mm. you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a bit. I'm, I mean, obviously, mm. you can't get a remote control that sends you into a TV show, but it, it was in some ways like that—that that 
Marvel TV show. What was that one called where they went into different classic TV shows? Uh, it was a mystery site, Mystery Theater 3000. No, no, I'm call- talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe TV show on Disney where they go, uh, they go into a TV show that's like I Dream of Lucy and... Oh, I haven't seen that one. I'm, oh, I'm not sure. Okay, I, I'll need to look up the title. So yeah. just pause well, for a sec while I look up that the, title. The, the, Academy Award, the Academy Award nominees, is an interesting list actually, is Jeanne Gian, Neen Oppelwall and Jay Hart for Best Art Direction and Set Decoration. Yeah, that was really good. Judiana Makovsky for best costume design and i hope you notice how i'm pronouncing all these words correctly jason I'm pretty oh, it's, it's uncanny it's it's like <clears throat> yeah it's like you've heard them and before. randy newman was nominated for best music and original dramatic score and i think he did a very good job randy newman on this movie oh okay I think I, the score was good so mm. so he did the score and then fiona apple did like the the cover of beatles across the universe that was over the end credits yeah i guess so but he he um i mean he's quite a famous Randy Artist Newman, and, yeah, um, Toy Story yeah, guy, isn't he? He's been a, he's been around a lot, yeah. So just to complete that TV show thought, it's WandaVision. I should have known that WandaVision. Oh, WandaVision. Yeah, yeah no, I haven't actually watched that. So yeah, so a very similar pre- premise that they are stuck inside a TV show, and and basically change the what's happening in in that world, um, because they're sort so, of coming in as outsiders. Anyway, have you heard of Gary Ross, Jason? No, Craig. What's he known for? This was his first well, movie, I think, wasn't it? Well, Gary Ross was the director. He was the key producer, and he was the screen. He's got screenplay credit. So I think that's the first time we've had someone do three things all at once. Yeah. We've had a few people do two, but we haven't had anyone do all three. So he was not only the director; he was the producer, and he wrote the screenplay. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, so I don't know a lot about Gary Ross. As as you say, I think he this is a fairly early, if not his first, it's certainly a very early one for him. I think it's the um, first could, movie he directed, but he was known as the writer of the movie Big, which is uh, that uh, comedy movie where the guy, you know, sw- what does he do? He, he becomes like a young boy and that's older. right. Yes, he's a, he's like a young kid, but he's actually adult size. Yeah, yeah. and um, he did a few other ones as well, but. Yeah, he's he's an interesting character. Been in a few things actually. Quite quite. Uh, oh, keeps going into photos. <clears throat> anyway, yes, he's he's an actor, a director, uh, done all sorts. His father. So he was he wrote the TV series The Hitchhiker in 1993, which I don't think I've seen. As you say, the Tom Hanks hit big, and then he did a bunch of other stuff as well. So mm. in the 80s mostly. 80s and 90s. The, the Hunger Games. Yeah, director. Oh, so he went on to do, he went on to do Sea Biscuit and The Hunger Games. Right, yeah, right. and Ocean's 8 as well. So um, mm. I really liked the, the Fiona Apple uh, song over the end credits. And after the movie, we watched the, the music video for it. And the music yep. video was filmed inside the set, the diner that, uh, uh, what's his name? The guy runs the. The little diner or the... Uh, that's the character of Jeff Janel, the uh, Jeff Janel's kind of character. Yeah, so so there's a scene in the movie where the townsfolk sort of riot and start smashing things up. They sort of cr- recreate that for the music video. And Amy Mann is in there, so, sorry, not Amy Mann, Fiona Apple is in there singing her song um, as all of these people riot around her. So I went into a bit of a rabbit hole uh, looking up that music video because I thought it was quite fascinating and I was wondering how they made it. It turns out it was directed by our mate Paul Thomas Anderson, who's a completely different movie director. He directed one of the big 1999 movies that we haven't watched yet. He was previously known oh. for directing Boogie Nights and a lot oh, of other right. movies like Lincoln and There Will Be Blood and, and things like that. And I was commenting on the movie night, you know, how did they make this music video? Because she's singing along while chaos is happening around her in slow motion. And I thought they must have got her to sing like lip sync a really fast version of the music so that they slowed everything down. But they had one of what they actually had is one of those motion tracking cameras. So this motion tracking camera, which would have been fairly new technology yeah. in 99, yeah. this motion tracking camera ran at four times the regular speed 
to sort of follow a person into the, you know, a person smashes the window of the store and it follows them inside and pans around and so forth. And then they repeated exactly the same camera movement at regular speed and they were the shots where Fiona Apple was in. And then they just edited those two scenes together. So I thought that that was quite interesting. Um, Apparently this movie has a little homage to the Shawshank Redemption, which is probably... How so? In the top, the top ten list of all movies of all time, I would have would have thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly, you know, in my list, it would certainly be in my list of one of the greatest movies ever made. Do you think um, American History X was a kind of little mini Shawshank Redemption, wasn't it? Not quite. It doesn't have as much <laughs> class as the Shawshank no. Redemption. But there's a shot of Bud raising his arms up in triumph during the oh, rainstorm. Yes. You know, yes. going like. And I like look at the rain. A crane the... shot with the camera yeah. above looking Which, down. Yeah. And writer and director Gary Ross thought that was a great idea. And he thought it was a great original idea until people kept pointing out to him that it's exactly the same as the scene from Shawshank. Oh, okay. So, so accidental. He was, he was a bit sad. Homage. Yeah. There's a lot of little tricks in this with the black and white scenes mm. to make it look like other movies. So there's a definite callback to Citizen Kane in there with the the big logo of the hands together when they're doing the town hall scene. Uh, yes, I don't yes. know if you've seen Citizen Kane, yeah, yeah. but I, as times. soon as I saw that, I was like, "That's just, he's got that from mm, Citizen mm. Kane. Um, you know, a lot of callbacks to other movies. There's apparently a bit of a callback in the bowling alley scene to the, uh, the Twilight Zone by Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock comes up a lot <laughs> mm, in, our, mm. in our analysis. The, the author of the book that Mary Sue is reading, of course, D.H. Lawrence, who is, I think, reasonably well known at this point. I mean, he was very controversial, and Lady Chatterley's Lover is well known as a very, you know, racy and, you know, mm. fascinating book. <clears throat> um, this was apparently Don Knotts' last live action appearance in a film. Yeah, well, he was pretty old. Yeah, he did tell it TV and cartoons, but he didn't do any other films after mm. this one. Uh as we noticed in the movie, there was a lot of situations where people were getting perfect scores. Obviously, right. at the beginning the of the movie, there was the there was the basketballs and <clears throat> and also in the bowling alley. I don't know if you noticed, but their scores were really high. So they were yeah. they had scores They're of two hundred thirty or more. Spare, straight, That's right. Yeah. yeah. So they had a lot of perfect scores. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that was a intent intentional thing. Jennifer enters Pleasantville and becomes this character, Mary Sue. I didn't know there's a little bit of a history to the term Mary Sue, apparently. Okay. Apparently, it's origi- originated in fan fiction to describe a character who comes into the characters' lives and solves all of their problems. Hang on. So these, these characters are often known as Mary Sue. Uh, it, it, this is, it originated in fan fiction. Um, this is what it says. What year would that um, have been? How long have people been I, writing fan fiction for? Oh, a long time. Really? Uh, it's also a fan fiction term for an idealised or perfect fictional character, apparently. I don't know. Look, I don't know. This is just a factoid I stole from I IMDb. I thought fan fiction was mm. more of an internet era kind of thing, because people can share things so much more easily. No, no, I don't think so. I mean, look, it's definitely a much bigger thing, but I think it's been happening for a while. Mm. Um, there's call-outs to Bewitched, obviously, yes. in this movie, which is a 1964 television series, and The Partridge Family. There's elements of The Partridge Family in this as well. Mm. Uh, Did, weren't we talking about Bewitch last week? What was the TV show that Crazy in Alabama, she went... Yeah, Bewitch. That was Bewitch. Bewitch. Isn't it that interesting? Bewitch. We've yeah. got ties between this week and, <clears throat> and last yeah. week. Um, during the publicity camp- campaign surrounding this film's release, there was a contest for a trip to Pleasantville, Iowa, which is the smallest Pleasantville in the United States. Apparently mm-hmm. there's quite a few of them. Well, they, they so, featured that in the movie, go. didn't they? So, yeah, yeah. So there's apparently the quite a few of those. The Pleasantville of your choice. And I was very disappointed to learn this little factoid because I really liked the art book that yeah, that uh, they really were, good. That Mr. Johnson was Don't reading. Don't tell me it was fake. They, yeah, no, they faked it. Oh. So the, the whole thing is a fake book. It was just a prop made for the film. And apparently I'm not the only person who went looking for it mm-hmm. on uh, mm-hmm on Amazon or whatever, because, yeah, it's it's a fake. Oh, I, well. I could have sworn that one of the paintings was the one from the Thomas Crown Affair as well. There was some very, yes, there was. You know, the little yeah, landscape could, one, yeah. the one yes, that he steals. Yes. Well, yes, it's very, they're very similar paintings, mm. that's right. Well, they're very famous paintings. 
little interesting thing about the grey makeup. Remember, we had a bit of a debate about the grey makeup on yeah, the yeah. movie night. Well, it actually, turns out that the grey makeup was was actually green. So, for the sequence where Bud is applying grey makeup to his mother, the makeup in that is actually green. Right, so and they can cream the key or something. Yeah, so the green tones were utilised to to create a mask for pl- replying desaturation. So, right. if they saw the green, they were able to desaturate it back down to grey. And then, on the other hand, she she is actually wearing grey makeup when she first visits the soda shop. Mm. And so she would have actually been wearing full green makeup, which would have looked pretty interesting, I would imagine, in real life. Yeah. Um, because, you know, that green that they use. Mm. And, yeah, and then Bill Johnson gets rid of it, takes it off her, you know, Jeff Daniels' ca- character. So, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of little homages. There's actually an homage to um, Patton. Uh, there's a movie called Patton, A Salute to a Rebel, which is, General Patton they're talking about there, and who was a famous general from the World War Two. Famously had a green face. Is that what you're saying? No, oh. no. But he gave a speech in front of an American flag in in this movie, and in uh, in that there's J T. Walsh is in front of a bowling alley, and it recalls Patton's speech in front of the American flag. Mm. And they also had the courtroom segregated, as you might have noticed into black and white characters downstairs, the black and white characters in this movie being the good people. That's and right. And the coloured characters upstairs. That was quite that's clever, a cool. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that I actually thought that was a call out to a bunch of movies, but they specifically mentioned To Kill a Mockingbird. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Which is probably where I did see it. Because yeah, yeah. when I saw the courtroom scene, I was like, I've seen that before. Yeah. And, it, and it was. It was from To Kill a Mockingbird. It was very so clever. And I'm glad they didn't overplay it. They just sort of, right towards the end mm. of the movie, they... You know, a few of the stores start putting up no coloured signs. Yes, like, I thought that was very clever. Oh, okay. Yes. So, and I mean, at this time, 1999, I think apartheid had only just ended mm. a few years before. So but, there you go. Yeah, it was it was an interesting little tale of like accelerated change. You know, so it's the change yes. that did happen between the 50s and and the end of the century, but sort of accelerated within a couple of, within a couple of weeks, I suppose. Yeah. Apparently some of the houses have been used in other movies, like the Lethal Weapon film franchise uses one of the houses that's across across the road from the main house okay. in the movie and things like that. So a lot of little call-outs to other movies and things in this movie. It's obviously like a, a fan movie in that sense. Yeah, um, yeah. Gary Ross is clearly a bit of a fan of all of these things. Well, so yeah, there you go. a movie about being in a TV show, it makes sense that you would yeah. call out to other TV shows and so forth. No, Pleasant Fool, it was really good. Enjoyed that one. And I can sort of hear an approaching musical theme. Dear, here we go. I don't think we're going to change it again, are we? I don't know. Are we changing to the new <laughs> one this week? Or are we still? Because you kind of you kind of, kind of, of broke it last week because you kind of cut it off last week. Well, but anyway. It's, it's got to be short and snappy. <laughs> All right. Go on then. All right, I can play the full one minute long version if you like. Just it's not one minute, it's thirty seconds. You told me I've had thirty seconds. It felt like a minute. Okay, (laughs) here we are. Time for intermission. Welcome, everyone, to Intermission. This week, we are going to do something a little bit different. I ha- I've had a look at the news of 1999, oh. Jason, after, after some criticism from from certain, cor- certain corners that I hadn't included the news yet. Mm. So what I have decided to do, because of the schedule that I've got for intermissions, and I've only got till the end of the year, obviously, I've split the year up into four parts. So this this week, we're going to look at January, February, and March of 1999, mm. and the big news events from those three months. And I, I would imagine you'll remember some of these, though you may not have been in the country for some of these. Uh, I these left events, at I the wonder. end of 99. So okay, okay, I couldn't remember exactly. So anyway, getting into it, uh, John Howard was the Prime Minister of Australia. Mm. Uh, he had been since 1996. It gets worse. The Premier of WA at this time was the Richard Richard Court. I think he's now Sir Richard Court. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong on that. Or Sir Dicker, some people call him. 
he was well into his second term, but there was a number of scandals and problems in these in these years, particularly because of the deals made between the government and his brother, Ken Court. There were some issues with finance breaking scandals. There was a lot of issues around old growth florists and all that kind of stuff. Jeff Gallup was the opposition leader at this mm. time. January 1st in 1999 was the introduction of the euro. Oh, okay. I didn't realise it was that long ago. Mm. Hmm. And this is an interesting one, which I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole on, and I hope you forgive me this one, but there was a memorial service held on the 1st of January at Constitution Jock in Hobart to remember the victims of the 1998 Sydney to Hobart yacht race. Uh Now, when we say the 1998 one, we actually mean the one, it's actually finished in this year. Mm. So it was still ongoing because the 1998 one started at the end of December and continued on into January. So it was the worst Sydney to Hobart race in terms of fatalities ever. Mm. Um, 55 sailors were rescued and six people died. I don't know if you remember this, but I do remember this. There was a massive storm all through mm. the race and there there was a lot of issues. And some changes were made to the race after this. They were getting winds in excess of 40 knots, which is apparently for these kinds of boats pretty full on. And Sayonara, which was skippered by Larry Ellison, who's a fairly famous person in tech. He's the founder and owner of Oracle, Jason. I don't know if you know that. No. Uh, um, sorry, Larry Ellison, you mean? Larry Ellison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with him. Yeah. So because of the severe weather conditions, uh, they, they, had, they had all sorts of dramas. So five boats sunk, seven were abandoned, 55 sailors had to be rescued, it's and it, in, rescue invo- efforts involved 35 military and civilian aircraft and 27, 27 Royal Australian Navy vessels. This is the largest ever peacetime rescue of, operation of its type. And unfortunately, six sailors died. So I thought it was worth spending a little bit of time on that one because it was a pretty big news story at the beginning of the year. NASA launched their Mars Polar Lander in that time. At the beginning of January, a lockout. There was a big dispute with the National Basketball Players Association at this time. The impeachment trial of President Bill Clinton began in the beginning of January. We'll probably come back to that one. the Sopranos debuted on HBO on January the 10th. Michael Jordan announces his second retirement from the NBA. That's going to come back. Going to play golf um, or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the US Coast Guard intercepted 4,300 kilograms of cocaine, the biggest drug, one of the biggest drug busts in American history. A thousand people died in the earthquake in Columbia in January. Family Guy, actually, this came up during the week. Family Guy deb- debuted on Fox Television. It's a long um, time ago there. as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So in Feb- moving on to February, um, Crown Prince Abdullah becomes the King of Jordan, and he's still the King of Jordan at the moment. Pluto regained its status briefly as the so- solar system's outermost planet after moving further away from the sun than Neptune, but then obviously we know that Pluto lost its planet status. Yeah, and it didn't even complete um, one orbit of the sun. Between being mm. discovered and being named not a planet anymore, isn't that crazy? No, poor thing. President Bill Clinton was acquitted by the Senate in his impeachment trial. Hang on. Uh, in February the 12th. Okay. Yeah, so the, I'm Short up. Short tri- trial. Yeah, well, you know, that's how these things go, I guess. Not with Trump. Um, in, <laughs> in India and Pakistan signed a, a weapon, signed a declaration on the use of nuclear weapons. I'm not sure that's ever been resolved even to this day. This is an interesting one. Eminem releases the Sim Slim Shady LP, mm. which is highly thought of by many people. Except for me. Probably, <laughs> probably not you, Jason, but yeah, okay. Legoland opens in California on March the, oh, wow. uh, the 20th, and the Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland join NATO back in March the 12th of 1999. Mm. Um, on March 21st, something that's close to our hearts, Jason, is the 71st Academy Awards. Okay. Uh, what took place? NATO started bombing over Yugoslavia. This this was a fairly horrible story at the time. There was lots of issues mm, in Kosovo mm. to do with Albanians and all that kind of stuff. So that was a fairly a movie that I'm not allowed to mention premieres on the March the 24th. Probably the biggest movie of the year. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say which one. The Melissa computer virus infect, infects Microsoft Word and Outlook Melissa. Um, worldwide. Melissa, that's right. Mm. And it doesn't just spin, um, spin the bingo machine. 
And I found this one quite interesting because I actually still own these shares. So there was a huge rush for Telstra shares on the 1st of February because they were released. I can't remember mm-hmm. if it was the second lot or the first lot. But I actually still own Telstra shares to this day were they, from this particular were they from this particular anything? thing. Um, yeah, they give me dividends. I think I get like sixty bucks a year or okay. something like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, there was an, there's a, a few things. There was some issues in Queensland. I think someone got left on a reef around this time when they were diving, and there was an inquiry into that. I don't know if you remember this story, Jason. No, it doesn't but, ring a bell. Um, to, Two divers from America got left on a reef. Oh, okay, yeah. And the boat returned to port and the divers obviously disappeared or died Mm. subsequently. Mm. So there was a there was a review into that in February and March. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. There was a thing called the Darling Darling Downs affair to do with the piggery that John Keating was involved with and apparently he lied to Parliament about. Oh, gee. He was out of he was out of Parliament, I think, by this time. Or he might still have been in Parliament, but he wasn't Prime Minister anymore. Mm. So there was a whole kerfuffle about that. It's always pinks. There was there was quite a big um, cyclone in Western Australia called Cyclone Vance, which had winds of up to two hundred and thirty kilometers an hour. And it completely well nearly completely destroyed the town of Exmouth. Which is ironic because about a decade, I think about two decades later, the same thing happened. Mm. In fact, they're still recovering from the last big cyclone up there, I believe. And media mogul Kerry Packer uh, thought that the federal government should deregulate the media and abolish cross-media ownership rules, which actually has had a fairly big effect over the last 20 years. It's having a superphoric effect. (laughs) Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's mm-hmm. oh, Bertrand Picard and Brian Jones became the first people to travel all the way around the world in a hot air balloon on March the 23rd. All right. And there you go. Well, there's some news from the 1999, but, early 1999. Balloon news, just to end it on there. I wanted to end it on balloon. You know how they always end, end it on a social interest story? Mm. You know? So I thought I'd end on that one, Jason. Maybe it can be all balloon news next time. All balloon. I'll, I'll try Just and find some more balloon news. The balloons of 1999. <laughs> the balloons of 1999. I'll look into it, Jason. I'll see if there's any more balloon stories for you. So that's intermission for this week. And now we'll cross over to ChatGPT to hear its synopsis of Girl Interrupted and maybe a little bit of comparison with Pleasantville. So let's go over to ChatGPT. Girl Interrupted, directed by James Mangold and based on Susanna Kaysen's memoir, stars Winona Ryder as Susanna, a young woman struggling with mental illness in the 1960s who finds herself in a psychiatric hospital. The film explores her journey of self-discovery and confrontation with her own personal challenges through her interactions with other patients, including a charismatic sociopath, Lisa, played by Angelina Jolie in an Oscar-winning performance. While distinctly different in setting and tone from Pleasantville, Both films delve into the themes of self-discovery and societal expectations, challenging their protagonists to confront and redefine their understanding of their worlds and themselves. Thanks for that, ChatGPT. And Craig, what did you think of Girl Interrupted? Um, I actually really liked Mm. Girl Interrupted. Mm. It was a tough movie to watch. Um, I I really liked it too, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I did, I did, early on in the movie, I was starting to question my own sanity at, um, watching movies picked by you but um at this point but um like, yeah I, I yeah i really liked this like movie. at the beginning movie. especially when she was like time jumping i thought that was so mm. well done because she would be yeah she'd be thinking about something or talking about something and suddenly jump to that point in time and you know as if she was transported there i, I thought all of those edits were really clever yeah no i thought this was a really I was surprised to see its Rotten Tomato score of 53%. Mm, why is it so low? How, however, uh, well, I have a theory on it. Well, not, not a theory. I have some information on that. It, it's subsequently got an 84% rating by users, mm. which, to be honest to you, I think is closer to its actual so what it deserves, deserved yeah. rating. Yeah. So a couple of the reviews I read of this movie, particularly the one in Variety, you know that I'm a bit of a Variety well, I've become a bit of a variety lover. Yeah, what did it say about the um, thesps? Yeah, oh, this one was actually done by Emmanuel Levy, who is a different oh. reviewer for a variety, and he can actually use words. So 
that was it. That this is slightly different. He calls this a middling film. Middling, and I think the I think the problem that, that a lot of people had with it was it didn't provide it didn't convey Susanna Kaysen's book very right, exactly. Right. It there was a lot of information in the book apparently that was left out of the movie. Mm. The movie kind of, and this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because we often criticise movies for having too much, having too much to say, and not mm. keeping it simple mm. enough. And yet, this movie, I think, got criticised for doing exactly that. It stuck to its core story and didn't go off on the tangents that were in the book. Right. So, for example, the the title "Girl Interrupted" is actually from a painting. I called "Girl Interrupted." It's "Girl Interrupted." Uh, by the D- girl interrupted at her music by Dutch painter Johannes Vermeer, right. which may well have been in the book in the last movie, actually. And the 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 interviewers seemed rather annoyed that the movie didn't talk about that at all because it is actually quite a key part of the book, apparently, okay. because she refers to it quite a bit. But look, I don't think the I think the movie stands very well on its own, it does, and I think yeah. it's it's a very strong and powerful movie. And I have to say, Winona Ryder's performance and Angelina Jolie's performance is simply terrifying. Like, she was really, really good. She actually was nominated and I believe won. She did win the I'm Oscar for it, yes. She won, the, she won an Oscar for Supporting mm, Actress mm. for this movie. But, but and I reckon yeah. Winona's great in this movie. She mm. really nails the role and she played a big part in getting this movie made, I think. She... Well, she actually had the rights to the book mm. and she was the executive producer of the movie. So she actually appointed the director, John Mangold, because she wanted the movie made, which I'm very I'm very fascinated by because she's a, I mean, this is 1999, mm. she's a fairly young woman and the fact that she managed to get a movie made, buy the rights to a book, get a movie made as an executive producer in this time period says a lot about yeah, her. Yeah, she I would think. have been 28, I think. She's mm. about my age. But, um, in a in a industry dominated by older men, she's uh, she's done very well. I yeah, think, yeah, 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 really impressive. Yeah. So, what I found, you know, just going off topic a bit, this movie has a lot of really great female performances. There's a lot of, like the cast is really strong. It was great to see Elizabeth Moss that we would know from West Wing and amongst other things. She was, yes. she was only seventeen at the time, I think. Yes. Um, also, Jared Leto pops up. Yes. But both Elizabeth Moss and Jared Leto are linked to last week's movies in some way. So remember last week I was saying that Meat Loaf and Edward Norton were in a movie together. Jared Leto is yeah. also in the movie with them. So that's another 1999 movie that we haven't yes, seen yet. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Moss, of course, was on the West Wing. And then last week we had Toby Ziegler in, in Crazy in Alabama. So... There is like a yeah, and I have I have a fairly strong feeling that at least one of these actresses actresses sorry is in uh, that TV series The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, uh, that, Claire Duvall Elizabeth, and Elizabeth Moss. Moss as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah Claire Duvall is also um, or Duval is in this movie. Oh, okay. Is in The Handmaid's Tale as well. And I know that I think Brittany Murphy, who's passed away now, but she was in another movie that we had seen this year, which is the that mockumentary about the beauty pageant, okay. Drop Dead Gorgeous. Yeah, look, I think this is a this is a really good movie for these female actresses. Whoop, whoop, um, Reese Witherspoon Goldberg, actually if, wanted. We didn't mention Whoopi Goldberg, of course. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg, I think, is magnificent yeah. in this movie. Yeah, she's I think good. she plays a really. Interestingly, she's very low down on the credits for some reason. She is, but yeah, it's a fairly minor. Yeah, role, which I don't. But, which I one. don't really understand because I really felt her to be like the third most important character in the movie, to be honest. After Winona and Angelina Jolie's character, I thought she was very key to the movie. Vanessa Redgrave as a a small role in this movie, uh, uh, as the uh, owner or director of the institution that they're all in at the time, um, and she does a pretty good job, though she's limited by, you know, the fairly emotionless delivery that she has to have for this particular role. Yep. It's actually filmed, this movie, at a place called the Harrisburg State Hospital, and this hospital was still in use for the treatment of mentally ill people until 2006. I, re- so, I read that. That's, that's a crazy fact, isn't it? You know, they filmed a mm, feature film in a, in in a, a facility hospital. that was actually still had patients. In use. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm assuming there must have been a section that they weren't using that they could use. Mm. So, um, yeah, um, Angelina Jolie revealed in an interview that she thought she was the only character who was sane in the entire film, yeah. and so that's how she paid it. She said, I actually was almost upset when people said I was so good at playing insane because I never thought she was insane. She was just very, very honest, mm. which I guess made her seem crazy. And, and, and yeah. mm. oh, do you know, there is a link between these two movies, Jason. And that What's is that the they're link? both quite long movies. Oh. They're both nearly two hours. You really, you really uh, push the friendship this week. <laughs> Four hours of movie watching, Jason. <laughs> it's a lot. But anyway, look, I this is one of those ones, and I'm I'm not giving you a hard time here, mm. but I honestly don't understand why this one. I can see why on the Rotten Tomato score, yeah. but it, it honestly deserves better than. It's because I didn't remember probably. it, and then I just went off the critic score when I was deciding what sure. this movie should go on to, but. Certainly, if I had my time again, I would bump Affliction to the B list. Yeah, and I'd I'd bring this into the A list. It was a much better movie. I genuinely think this is one of the better movies of the year. Mm. I think if I was going to list good movies that we've seen so far, yeah, this one. I mean, this one is one which you can enjoy, even though it's quite hard to watch. Particularly those final scenes mm. are very difficult mm. to watch. It is still a very good movie, and I think all the more impressive for the fact that it's it's really focused on only a very small number of characters. There's a lot of supporting characters, but really, really quite impressive. I think the performance of Winona Ryder is fantastic. Angelina Jolie, excellent. And I and I really liked the understated performance of Whoopi Goldberg in this. Yeah, yeah. She was really, yeah. really very good. So Yeah, she was good. The cinematography and the music in this was quite good as well. I quite enjoyed the music. It's set in New England. We're back in New England, Jason, mm. after a little bit of a sojourn away. I think our last movie, well, it was set in Pleas- Pleasantville. Does it actually tell us where the house is in um, in the in the real life, mm. uh, Pleasantville? No, I know, no, I'm, I'm not sure where it is. I'm... A factoid or two. Um, out of a cast who were all portraying or put, supposed to be portraying teenagers, only Elizabeth Moss was actually a teenager. That's right. Winona Ryder and Jared Leto, Leto were 28. They don't look like teenagers, to be honest. Angelina Jolie was 24. I didn't, I didn't think of her as a teenager, but maybe I was supposed to. And Claire Duval and Brittany Murphy were both 22. And most of the other characters were in their 20s or 30s, in fact. Uh, Jill Armin Mante, who played that, the girl who, you know, hung herself, mm. the chicken. Ch- chicken girl. Chicken girl, yeah. That wasn't disturbing at all. Courtney Love actually auditioned for the role of Lisa. I wonder why she didn't movie. get it. Uh, well, she would have. She probably would have fitted the role, but I don't think she would have played it as well no, as Angelina no. did. She, she wasn't uh, great in 200 Cigarettes. It's interesting. This movie cast has four Oscar winners in it. Angelina Jolie, Jared Leto. Whoopi Goldberg and Vanessa Redgrave mm. and Winona Ryder has been nominated for Oscars. Yeah, it's yeah, a strong so. cast. Really good mm. performances. Good movie. Uh, this is one of many roles in which Winona Ryder's character writes in a diary. Only it's a thing. Mm, well, yep. Yep, that happens. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I reckon we can just about wrap this up, Craig. Yeah, well, I, look, I... I Look, I would recommend this movie, though it's a tough watch. I would recommend it. Yeah, it was a really good week. Two very strong movies. We don't get that too often with the A and the B lists. So I was quite happy with that. And I think now it's time to cut live, not to the movie night, because there is no movie night this week, but we are going to do a secret rolling of the bingo ball, and then we'll announce that on the movie night so that people can watch the movies if they choose to. So we will cut live to an undisclosed location for a secret rolling of the bingo ball to find out which two movies we'll be talking about on next week's show. So let's go over to Future Jason now. And Dana's on the ball. And what number is it going to be? We're hoping for a movie that's not going to be a crowd pleaser since we won't be around. And it is number 36. So number 36 is The Winslow Boy. From the commanding officer of the Royal Naval College at Osborne, reporting the theft of a five shilling postal order was cashed by your son, Cadet Ronald Arthur Winslow, that they must therefore request you to withdraw your son from the college. If you did it, you must tell me. Did you steal this postal order? No, Father, I didn't. 
from acclaimed writer-director David Mamet. The father's fight for his little boy's honor. Well, I venture to think the case has rather wider implications than that. One can not sue the crowd. I intend to fight this monstrous injustice with every weapon at my disposal. Catherine Winslow. Robert Morton. I want the best. The best in this case is not Morton. Then why does everyone say he is? No one need ever have known about Oswald if you hadn't shouted it out to the whole world. But isn't it already too late? Even if we throw up the case, would you still want to marry the Winslow girl? All that will blow over in time. I'm rather surprised that a case of this sort should interest you. My attitude has been the same as yours, a determination to win at all costs. Our concern for the boy might perhaps tarnish the reputation of Lord Nelson. So Robert is going to ask you a few questions which you must answer truthfully as you always have done. I suggest that by continuing to deny your guilt you are causing great hardship to your family and considerable annoyance to high and important persons in this country. I didn't. You are a forger, a liar and a thief. No, no, it isn't true. None of it's true. Oh yes, the boy is plainly innocent. Are we both mad, you and I? Tell me. Should we drop the whole thing? I don't consider that a serious question. Nigel Hawthorne, Rebecca Pigeon, Jeremy Northam, Gemma Jones, and Guy Edwards. The Winslow Boy. A toast to the happy pair. Doesn't it say, let right be done? Then we must endeavor to see that it is. The new film by David Mamet. And the Winslow Boy has been paired with Mumford. Maybe you want to tell me a little about what brought you here. Kind of impatient for a big time head shrinker, aren't you? How about you let me explain it my way, okay? Thanks, that'd be great. Hi, you must be Dr. Mumford of Mumford. What kind of doctor are you? PhD, psychologist. Not a real doctor. That's right, the fake kind. How long have you been in this town? Oh, I don't know. Four months, two and a half weeks. And you've already got more patients than those other two shrinks combined. Everyone in Mumford is sharing their secrets with a new psychologist. Feel free to lie down. I better not. I'll fall right to sleep. I think it's too soon for me to be sleeping with you. But he's got the biggest secret of all. You want to know a secret? I'll tell you a secret. I am not now, nor have I ever been, a psychologist. Jeez, man, but you're good at it. Don't you find it incredibly convenient that everyone who could possibly corroborate his story has recently died some exotic death? My graduate advisor died quite tragically in the collapse of a gazebo. You're shockingly honest. That's what makes you great. I don't know all that much about psychology or therapy or ethics. This fall, I'm from the state certification board. The truth, it's the fan. If you have any information about this man, contact your local law enforcement agency. This shrink school you went to, did you hear about it on an infomercial? From Lawrence Kasdan, writer director of The Big Chill and Grand Canyon. Hey, Doc. I didn't realize you're so young to be so. I may be young, but Doc can tell you I'm very immature. Mumford. You've fallen in love with one of your patients? Doc. It's not me, is it? Back to you in the studio. And there you go, Craig. So, no movie night this week. We'll have to watch those movies mm. on our own time, but then we'll reconvene next weekend to record the podcast for next week's show. I should be at, I should be at a loss this Sunday, I'm sure. And we've just I finished... Be sad and... Well, we've done 17, so we've just finished episode 17, so it's quite a long haul. And yeah. that means that we are now a third of the way through the year. Wow. So 17 it's in the It's amazing how time flies, eh? It is, yeah, yes. Well, very good. Yeah. So looking forward to the rest of the year. So it should yeah, be good. Well, I've been planning out my intermissions, listeners, for the <laughs> rest of the year. So probably some of them much to Jason's disgust, but that's okay. Oh, it's always an, okay. a nice change of scene before between the movies. I thought I did a pretty good job of getting through three months of news in like five minutes. So I thought I did a good job there. Anyway. Oh well. So we will leave the last word as usual to David and Margaret who will be giving us their thoughts about Pleasantville over the ending music. And for me, that's goodbye. Goodbye everyone. Well now to a place where life does more than just imitate art. Pleasantville. Well, this is such a clever film. It's so original in the way it confronts the confusion of living in the 90s in a scary, dangerous world with the order of the way we think it used to be. This seemingly serene life of so long ago has hidden frustrations, and it only takes the efforts of Mary Sue to uncover a lot of them. Thank you, David.
I do, Margaret, and I, and I also think it's, a, it's really a film for people today who look back at the 50s and say things were better then. I love the colour design, the way the colour begins to seep into the black and white as things begin to change in Pleasantville. I really think it's a, a lovely film. I'm giving this four stars. I'm going to give it three and a half.